when you go outside on a sunny day and stand out in the sunshine, you feel warm. And you can tell where that warm feeling is coming from. It's coming from that big bright thing up in the sky that you call the sun. You can tell that that is radiating heat, which you are receiving and which you are feeling. So that big bright thing up in the sky is a source of heat, like you were standing near a bonfire and receiving heat from a bonfire. Only this thing is really far away. It must have a lot of heat to it in order for you to feel warmth from it from such a distance. So that thing up in the sky must be burning if it's creating that much heat. Well, what kind of burning? What is making it burn? If you think about burning here on Earth, you think about when you light a fire, if you understand how that works, you understand oxygen is combining with other carbon-based molecules and that's coming together to release heat in a chemical way. So when we finally understood enough about chemistry, we thought, could the sun be burning oxygen together with carbon-based molecules in order to create that much heat? Well, they did the calculation and they found out if the sun was full of oxygen and other carbon-based molecules, it should have burned itself out a long time ago. It wouldn't have enough to burn for a long time. And we've been wondering what makes the sun burns for all of human history. So that's not it. Plus, we take a look at the spectrum of the sun when we understand spectroscopy, and we don't see that much oxygen and other carbon-based molecules in it. What we mostly see is hydrogen the simplest element. So it was very confusing to people for a long, long period of time. What exactly was it that the sun was burning? How did it create its energy and its heat? It wasn't until some genius came along and told us, hey everybody, E equals MC squared. You can get matter to turn into energy energy could turn back into matter. Whoa, we didn't, we hadn't thought of anything like that before, but yes, that genius was Einstein, and he proposed these ideas in the early 1900s. So it was because of E equals mc squared that we finally th saw there was another way of producing energy from matter rather than just chemical combustion. We have really only known how the sun works for only a little more than a hundred years of human history. So, what are those methods for doing E equals MC squared that we know about? Fusion is one of them, where you fuse together two small atoms, two small nuclei, to make a larger nucleus. And then there's fission, where you can have a nucleus that's so large, it has a hard time even holding itself together, and it very happily would split itself apart and release energy in the process. So in both of these cases, when the mass is coming together or being split apart, some of that mass can actually give up its form of mass and turn it into energy that goes into the new particles. And that kind of thing must be happening in the sun in order to power it up. Which one should it be? The fission, taking large nuclei, large elements and splitting them apart? Or should it be the fusion? taking small elements and putting them together to make larger ones. Remember, when we look at the sun with spectroscopy, we mostly see hydrogen. So it's got to be hydrogen that is going to come together in a fusion process in the core of the sun, in the center of the sun where it's hot enough to have things fuse together. So we're going to do a, just a little review here of some of the symbols that are used to represent hydrogen and when it fuses together it becomes helium. If you take a look at things on this slide and you say H1 is hydrogen, that's what it's made of, and H2 is another form of hydrogen, that's what it's made of, and you look at these heliums and you say, I already know all that, well, that's okay then. Uh, you can skip ahead if you want to. This is a review if people would be more comfortable having a renew of these terms before a review of these terms before I start talking about other more detailed reactions that use these ideas. So in the upcoming slides, we might see pictures of neutrons and protons. 
where we've decided to color the protons red and the neutrons blue. The protons, remember, are the ones that have a positive charge. So notice that this draws a proton as a red ball. Down here they show a red ball with positive charge and then put an H under it. So you're going to see sometimes in some textbooks that they're going to write helium, I mean hydrogen, when they're also talking about it equivalently as a proton. They're just ignoring the fact that there's an electron that would be going around a hydrogen atom. And that's because we're really just trying to focus on what's happening with the nucleus of the atoms. The, pro the electrons in orbit aren't taking part in anything that's going on. So this would be a proton or a hydrogen. When you add a neutron to that, you keep the same amount of charge because there's still only one proton there. So this still has one positive charge to it, but it's got almost twice the mass when you added in a neutron. That form of hydrogen has a two up in the corner to tell you that you have a proton and a neutron there. And yes, the electrons are always riding along with that when it's an atom. Okay, So hydrogen is just your basic proton with an electron in orbit. But the next form of hydrogen is given the name deuterium, like duo, like two, because it has two particles in the nucleus. There is also another form after that called tritium, which has an H3, because there are two neutrons added in. But that's not part of our story, so we don't need to include that one. The element that we have here, which has a three up there, is the less common form of helium that has two protons, otherwise it wouldn't be helium and then one neutron added to that. The picture would look like this, where you have two positive charges and then one neutron with it. This is the more common form of helium that has two protons and two neutrons. So this charge is still positive two because of the two protons, but with those additional two neutrons, there are a total of four particles in the nucleus for a regular helium and we're going to see these different forms of helium in our upcoming discussion of the fusion process. Before I can tell you all about the fusion process, I'm going to have to give you a particle physics lesson. I have to explain to you how the smallest things in the universe work in order for you to understand how some of the biggest things in the universe work. Our particle physics lesson here is also going to be the first step in the fusion process that we're going to discuss next. So this is the story of what happens when you've got two protons coming together fast enough to collide because remember they don't want to get next to each other. They both have positive charge so they want to repel each other. The only way you're going to get over that repulsion is to make them go really fast. In a star, the only way to make them go really fast is to make them have lots of heat, which gives them lots of kinetic energy, which gives them lots of speed to collide together before they can repel apart. So two fast protons come in here and smash together. What comes out? We're actually able to make devices where we can see the scattering of the particles once they come out and we know what charge they have because we can curve them in magnetic fields. We're just drawing nice straight lines for this diagram though to show you two protons smash together and then things come out. And here's the biggest piece that comes out down here. This is the deuteron. This is deuterium where you have one proton and one neutron coming out. But hey, we put two positive charges into this we're only getting one of those positive charges coming out because this other one's a neutron. And you have to have the same amount of charge going in that you have coming out. So where's the other positive charge? It's over here with this particle called a positron. I wonder why? Yeah, because it's positively charged. So a positron is represented by a letter E with a plus sign. Well, why'd you do that? It's a positron. Why didn't you use the letter P? Because you use that for a proton, for one thing. But for the other thing, I represent an electron with a letter E for electron and put a minus sign there because an electron has a negative charge. Well, a 
positron gets a letter E because it has the same mass as an electron. It's just that it has the same mass with a positive charge. Not only that, the positron is the antimatter particle for the electron. And yes, there really is antimatter. It's not just a Star Trek or a science fiction thing. This is one of the things that you want to carry away from what we're talking about here. If you didn't know that antimatter was real before, you know it now, okay? There really are antimatter particles in the universe, and it's even taking place in our own sun where an antimatter particle would be produced from the collision of two regular matter particles. So out pops an antimatter particle, the positron, from this reaction. And if that were to go on and hit an electron, then their two m masses, matter and antimatter, would collide together, completely annihilate, annihilate each other, and E equals mc squared would take over, turning all of their mass into complete energy. Next part of the story. When we look at these particles that are coming out and we can see their tracks, we can use the tracks that we see for the ingoing and the outcoming particles and we can calculate how much energy they had going in and how much momentum they had going in. And momentum is a thing that's conserved, remember? So when the momentum goes in, the same amount of momentum has to come out with all of the particles coming out. And they calculated the outcoming momentum when they could see the deuteron and when they could see the positron. And the momentum story told them something's wrong. There's momentum missing. But momentum had to be coming out, so that means momentum came out with something else that we didn't see. But we saw everything that had a charge. That means the thing that's coming out must not have had a charge. It must have been neutral. And we're not missing too much momentum, so it probably doesn't have very much mass when it comes popping out. This new little neutral particle that was, had to have come out, but wasn't actually seen yet, was called the neutrino. And the neutrino has almost no mass. In fact, for the longest time, they thought it actually had no mass, but still carried momentum. That sounds a little strange to some people who, th who remember moment, moment, momentum is supposed to be mass times velocity. But even a, pro a photon, a particle of light, has momentum when it has no mass. So the neutrino, a small little particle, no charge to it, almost no mass. Here's how we represent it. This looks like a V with a subscript E but this is just because I can't find a good font for showing you proper Greek letters and put it into PowerPoint. This should be a Greek letter nu, which curves on both sides to make it properly, like a curvy V. So you would use a Greek letter nu for neutrino. And you put a little E down on the bottom of it because this is only one kind of neutrino. They went on and discovered that there are other two other kinds of neutrinos. This kind of neutrino happens when you've got some kind of reaction that puts out either a positron or an electron. And since it happens with those kinds of particles, it gets a little subscript E. The other particles that they learned about later were the tau particle and the mu particle. So they also have their other neutrinos with those interactions. And so those are called the three flavors of neutrinos. The electron neutrino, the tau neutrino, and the muon neutrino. So let's summarize what we've seen so far for our particle physics lesson, lesson and for our first reaction here. We are smashing together two protons. One proton plus another proton is going to smash together and other stuff's coming out. You can also represent this by saying, one hydrogen plus one hydrogen is going to smash together and what comes out? What's this kind of hydrogen? It's the kind that has one proton and one neutron. These two pieces up here are represented by this one symbol down here. That's this particle, the deuteron. Then you also have coming out the positron 
and you also have coming out the neutrino. Okay, now that's your particle physics lesson. How does this all go together to make a fusion process?